A very short time, talk about two big things. Jesus, holy and anointed one. You, as a follower of Jesus, a little anointed one, are meant to be holy and anointed. Jesus was holy and Jesus was anointed. Two simple things I'd like to bring and present to you tonight, and then we'll close in some time of prayer together. These are two elements of Jesus' life. They're two elements meant to be of our life as well. Jesus was completely holy. God the Father says, be holy even as I am holy. That's a big deal. How can we be holy like Jesus was holy? It's good for us to know that Jesus was perfectly righteous, perfectly holy, never in sin, never in error. It's important to know that Jesus died on the cross for us. That's correct, right? But why didn't Jesus just come on a Friday night, get crucified on the cross, and be raised again on Sunday? Why did he not just come for a weekend if all it took was his death, burial, and resurrection? But it also took a perfect life as well. He had to be a perfect sacrifice, so he had to spend 33 years living in perfect righteousness before his Father. And so Jesus, in all his speech, all his motives, all of his actions, all of his thoughts, even though he was tempted like all of us are, was perfectly righteous. So that when he went to the cross, he was um, a, a, an innocent one, being sacrificed for the guilty ones. If he was a guilty one, then he would just have to pay, as Hebrews says, pay for his own sins. But he paid for the sins of the world. In the Old Testament, there was a time where the, uh, the priest, the high priest would come together, and all of Jerusalem and Israel would come together. Historians tell us there might have been upwards of three million people coming into the city at the time, and they were all bringing their lambs and their rams and their goats and their turtle doves. I don't know what a turtle dove is, but they'd bring, I'm not sure if it was a turtle or a dove, but it was a turtle dove. And they'd bring them into the, to the temple, and the priest had a, a particular place of an altar, and they would cut the the sacrifice, and the blood would pour off the altar into uh, almost like a river, and the river would flow out of the temple into the, and sometimes even into the streets. Now, can you imagine three million people, all of them bringing their rams and their lambs and their, and their turtles and their doves and, and sacrificing them on the altar? Do you know how much blood was running through the streets? And that was for the sins of all the people. Each person had to represent a sacrifice of blood for their own sins. Now, the hard part with that was um, could you imagine bringing your sacrifice and saying, I've been waiting for a year to get rid of all my sin, all my guilt, all this weight on me. And you go to the altar and you sacrifice, you're, you say you got a nice lamb there and, you, and he cuts it and the blood pours out. And you go, that blood uh, is the penalty for my sin. Instead of my blood that, that I owe, that, that lamb, God is kind to allow that to be standing in my place, condemned in my place. And uh, could you imagine doing that? Like, ah, oh, feels good, right? I'm free, I'm a victory. And you walk out of the temple like, oh, I'm free, uh, I'm in victory. And you see somebody you don't like and you go like, oh, it's you. And bitterness rises up in your heart. And you go like, oh, no. I've only been out of the tabernacle to the temple for 10 minutes and I'm already back in sin. And now I have to wait 365 days to do that again. And when I was, uh, when I grew up in a, a particular type of church that believed, um, and I don't believe this theology, but they, they taught that if you sinned, you would lose your salvation. So Jesus saved you by grace, but if you sinned, you lost your salvation. So you would have to come on Sundays to the altar. We called this the altar, the begin, the front of the church. You had to come to the altar and get saved again. And of course, as a young man, I sinned every single week. I usually sinned on Sunday afternoon. Let alone, and I tried my best to sin on Saturday night. Uh, that's, that's a good strategy if you have that kind of theology because you have a shorter chance of missing the rapture and, and not being saved. So late Saturday night, early Sunday morning, get saved real quick. You have a, a, a very low level of, chance, of risk. And so, but that's what it was like in the Old Testament. But then Jesus comes along and says, um, this sacrifice, his sacrifice would be so perfect, so pure, so strong, so powerful, it was one time forever, one time for all of us. And, and it did away with the totality of thousands of years of animal sacrifice. Just did it away. We don't need it anymore because Jesus came one for all. He came for you. So now there's a, an old song that says, in my place he stood condemned. And what, the, what that song means and what that theology represents is on the cross, he not only bore your sin, he took your sin on the cross, but he did something else. 
And oftentimes we stop at that one element and saying, he took my sin from me. But here's what else he did. He imparted his righteousness to you so that you are righteous. Amen. Kelly feels it. <laughs> this is, this is going to be really awkward and really unusual and really strange. How many of you are righteous? Raise your hand if you're righteous. Okay. Looks like about a third of you are righteous. How many of you are Christians? Raise your hand if you're a Christian. Okay, every one of you that just raised your hand the second time, from now on, raise your hand the first time. <laughs> because it's, you can't be a Christian unless you're righteous. Because, because it's the righteousness of Christ that, that, that on the cross he bought not only your sin taking away, but he put himself in you. The reason we don't raise our hand oftentimes is sometimes it's humility, and I just, but sometimes it's behavioralism. Does that make sense? Like I don't really feel like I'm behaving righteously. I don't feel like I'm living up to God's standard. Now, holiness, Jesus was holy. He wants us to be holy. He wants us to be cleansed of all behavioral things in our life that don't belong in our life. But as far as our standing in Christ Jesus, I'm going to say it as clearly as I can. You are already righteous in Christ. You can't become more righteous than you are right now. You're not going to earn your way to a higher level of righteousness. You might start doing things that have more of a righteousness in its element and its deeds, but in your heart, in your cleansing, in your purity, in your, in your uh, redemption, you'll never be more righteous than you are right now. That's why Paul says, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. He didn't say, I'm trying to become righteous in God in Christ. I already am righteous in God in Christ. And so Jesus was perfectly righteous, and he died for our sins, but, and so all our sins are on him, but all his righteousness is on us. So you're already righteous. And, and I believe it's from that place we have our victory. If you have what uh, Romans calls a sin consciousness, you're always, I'm such a terrible sinner. I'm, I, keep, I, can't, I, can't, I mess up every day and I lose it every day and God must not be pleased with me and I'm so unhappy with myself and he's so unhappy with me. It's called sin consciousness and I did that again and I keep doing this and, and when will I ever get free of that and, and repenting of the same sin that you already repented for? How many times does it take to repent for a sin? One time. And, and, and Jesus says, confess your sins and he'll cleanse you of how much unrighteousness? all of it. So he's cleansed us. When we come to him, he's put all that righteousness in us. And so we, we come to him with that sense of his victory is ours. The, the devil's been defeated and we are now righteous in Christ Jesus. And so we think to ourselves that I have to try to become righteous by my behavior. I have to try harder in my own strength. And I try harder, but it's not to become righteous. I try harder to love Jesus more and to serve him more and to become more like him in his image, uh, formed in, into his image, uh, growing in, in holiness, but knowing who I am in Christ Jesus. And sometimes we try to battle, uh, let's put it this way, we feel like Jesus did us a good deed by saving us from our sin, and now it's our turn. Now, now, now I'm going to do him a favor by trying to, to be holy myself, trying to be sanctified. You can be no more sanctified than you can save yourself. Your, your righteousness and salvation comes from him. Your sanctification comes in Christ Jesus. He empowers you to do the things that are in your heart. He puts in your heart a desire, I don't want to sin anymore, and then he gives you the power to live that out. And some of us think that, well, he gave me salvation, so now it's my power that has to do it. And I call it bootstrapping. I don't know if you use that term here in Scotland. You kind of pick yourself up by your own bootstraps, or you white-knuckle it, you're grabbing, you hold it, and I'm not going to sin anymore. I'm never going to do that again. And the more you're trying to say, I'll never do that again, I'll, like you young men, I'll never lust again. I'll never lust after a woman again. Even though women are pretty, oh, man, they are so gorgeous. I, oh, I really like women. Uh, you know, especially so-and-so. She, she, and all of a sudden, you're... You're in a different place. You trying to st strive for yourself is a sin consciousness. And sin consciousness leads you into sin. If I'm aware and zeroing in on my sin, then, then when we come to church, we might as well sing in like, I love you, sin, and I worship you. You know, it's like, because we're thinking about it all the time. Where our mind is, there comes from our heart. Our mouth speaks issues from our heart. And if all we're talking about is to somebody, I sinned again yesterday, and I'm, I feel like I'm going to sin again today, and sin has got such a grip and a hold on me, 
It doesn't. It really doesn't. The Satan's lying to you and saying it does, but it doesn't. And all you have to do is become aware of what Jesus has already done for you. And when you're aware of what he's done for you, all of a sudden the weight of sin the, and the false accusation of the devil is off on you. So if you're saying to yourself, uh, I am lustful, I am angry, I am, I am selfish, I'm full of pride. And all you're doing when you do that, I, I, now I do that in an honest confession. Like, oh, I just did that. I'm not going to, Lord, I confess that to you. I give it up to you. But then it's gone. I don't wallow in that. I don't continue in that. And some of us spend all our time continuing, rehearsing over and over and over again the same problem, the same sin, rather than giving it up to the Lord. And we don't understand that, that we have been justified. We have been washed. We have been cleansed. The sin has, Romans uh, tells us that sin has no dominion over me because I am not under the law, but I'm under grace. That's powerful. Why does sin not have dominion over you? Because you're trying really hard? No, because you promise God you'll never do it again? No, because sin has no dominion over me because last Sunday night I was at the altar and I prayed and I said, no more sin, dominion over me. No, that doesn't do it. You can come to the altar a thousand times and still go out with a sin consciousness until you come to the place where you realize this passage in Romans is so true. Sin shall not have dominion over me or you. Why? Because we're not under the law, but we're under grace. If you reverse that around, sin will have dominion over you if you're under the law. What is the law? Trying to do it in your own strength. And so Jesus was totally righteous, and the only way we're going to walk in that righteousness is to understand we are grafted into Christ Jesus, and his blood has covered us, not just a, a, a historical forgiveness of sin, but it's constantly on us. The blood of Jesus Christ uh, sees us, and he changes us. One last thing, and then I'll go into the second point. Um, when I was young, I was taught this, like, when I go to heaven, um, <clears throat> the Father God is not going to see me and my sin, he's going to see Jesus. Have you ever heard that? Like, like God won't look at me, he'll look at Jesus, and it's Jesus' righteousness that will cover me, and then I can be accepted by the Father. And, and that sounds kind of okay, but it also sounds kind of weird, like, I'm going to get to heaven, and I've got to hide behind Jesus, like, Jesus, don't let the Father see me. It's like, you, you go out, you, you speak to him, don't, you know, I'm high, I'm, I'm afraid of him. That's not what heaven's going to be like. He's going to say, come out behind him, stand with him. He's your brother, he's your elder brother. Stand up there and let me see you because his blood washed you. His blood cleansed you. His blood made you righteous. You're holy in my sight. You're my friend. You're not my enemy. You don't need to hide. Not even behind Jesus. Now, don't hear me wrong way. We are in Christ, and it's all because of him. But when we stand before God, he likes us. When, when, when the blood of Jesus Christ washed you and cleansed you, and you became a new creation, God looks at you now with approval. He, he, looks, he, he not only loves you, he likes you. He looks at you and says, you're good, you're, you're, you're pure, you're holy, you're true. And we need to say things about ourselves that God is saying about us. The Lord spoke to me just recently, and I was kind of wallowing in this place, when, oh, I did that again, and I'm so sorry, Lord. I don't know how many times am I doing this. I seem to be stuck in that same habitual pattern. You know, and I just was, again, uh, almost being more conscious of my sin than I was Christ, and I was, I was sort of criticizing myself, and the Holy Spirit spoke to me. He said, when you criticize yourself, you're criticizing me. Does that make sense? When you criticize yourself, you're criticizing him. Why? Because he's the one who's doing the work, good work in you. He's bringing it to completion, and he looks at you and goes like, that's good. That's, that's pure. That's righteous. And if you call it unclean, that's what he said to Peter when, remember, he let the, 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 the sheet down, and there was unclean things on it, and he says, take and eat this thing. And Peter says, I can't eat that. It's unclean. And Jesus, from the voice from heaven, said to him, don't call what I've made clean unclean. And that's a command to us. Don't call yourself unclean when Jesus made you clean. Don't dare call yourself unclean when Jesus made you clean. So Jesus is the holy one, and in him you are holy and you are righteous. Jesus is righteous and uh, holy, and he's anointed. In the last few minutes I have with you, let me talk about the anointed part of Jesus. The anointing means um, rubbed off on, like um, you take an oil and maybe if you have a, a burn, you rub it off, you rub that ointment into the skin, and it becomes a part of your, 
it becomes part of the wound and heals it. It, it, uh, it can refresh the skin. And so the anointing is originally, originally, it's the same word as charisma. If you've heard of like a charismatic church, it's the charisma anointing. And so Jesus was not only holy, but he was anointed. If he was just holy, it would be like, wow, a holy man, and he lives up on the mountains in Tibet, and he lives righteously, and he's perfect before God. But I thank the Lord that our role model, Jesus Christ, was not only holy, but he was anointed. And in Acts 10, 38, it says, we know about Jesus. I love this. We, we know about Jesus, and he went about doing good. That's what he did. He just spent his life going about doing good, not just saying, can you guys look at me a little bit more because I'm really shining in holiness. You know, hey, I'm, I'm really, I go to holy places and I say holy things and I do holy kind of events. No, he, he said, I'm holy and he's anointed as well. And he says, so it says, we know about Jesus and he went about doing good, healing all who were sick and oppressed, preaching the good news to the poor, for God was with him. And God was with him not only in his personal sanctification and righteousness, but he was with him, in his holiness and righteousness, but he was with him in his anointing. And the same anointing that was in Christ Jesus can be in us. The Father and the Holy Spirit who anointed Jesus is meant to anoint you and I so that we can have the same anointing that Jesus had. And we can heal the sick like Jesus healed the sick. And we can cleanse the lepers like Jesus cleansed the lepers. And we can raise the dead like Jesus raised the leper. And we can open blind eyes like Jesus opened blind eyes. And we can preach the good news to the poor and see the power of God released in the church just like Jesus did. That's such good news to know that our life has meaning and purpose. And it is a personal holiness and sanctification, meaning and purpose. But I thank God it goes beyond that. And he can use me and you. And he can trust you and I. And we can see the anointing of God set captives free. I was so thrilled to, not too many months ago I was on a bus. And I was traveling to the airport, and I was sitting on my, in my seat in the bus, an empty seat next to me, and there was a woman across the aisle on the other side, and a younger lady, and, and I noticed she was kind of looking at me, and, and I was kind of like trying not to look at her. And it was really awkward, because she got up, and then she came and sat next to me, and I'm going like, I have a ring here? Like, it's the first time in 30 years I thought a woman was attracted to me other than my wife, so I was like, <laughs> kind of felt good, but at the same time, I was like, yeah, I'm scratching my head right here. And she leans over to me, and she says, um, were you one of the speakers at the conference? I had been speaking at a conference in Texas. And um, I said, yeah, I was. And I said, were you there? She goes, yes, it was brilliant. And I'm going, oh, good. And this is a Christian thing. And, um, <laughs> and, and she says, oh, it's brilliant. When you began to describe uh, mid-century, 15th century German artwork in medieval times, it, it was just so brilliant. I'm going like, that was a different conference than I was at. <laughs> Either that or my talk was way off. I mean, I don't think I talked about that. Sometimes I don't know what I'm talking about, but I'm pretty sure I would remember talking about mid-century, mid-1500s medieval German artwork. And so I said, no, I think you got the wrong conference. And you go, you look just like the guy from Germany. And I said, like, I don't talk like I'm from Germany, do I? And she said, no, but he was speaking anyway. Uh, so, so I said, well, oh, so you're an artist? She says, yeah, I'm, I live in New York City, and uh, I'm an artist. And she said, well, what do you do? And I said, well, I was speaking at another conference, and I told them what I told some of the folks at the conference yesterday. She said, what do you do for a living? I said, I got the best job in the world. She said, really? What is that? I said, I get to travel around the world and just tell, tell people Jesus loves them. And she goes, wow, that's really weird. And <laughs> she did. She said, that's, that's really unusual. It's strange. And I said, no, it's really good because... Uh, people are troubled and people are hurting and marriages are falling apart and all of a sudden she looked at me like with shock and she goes, you know what, that re I really relate to that because I was at this conference and the whole time I was there and she said, as a matter of fact, throughout my whole life, I've been feeling like I don't fit in and my artwork doesn't live up to other people's artwork. And she told me later she was a world-renowned artist, been put in Time Magazine and New York Times and all kinds of stuff, but her own soul was so hurt and wounded Everywhere she went, she felt totally unworthy. Totally unworthy. She said, I just don't fit in. And when I say things to people, I think they're thinking of me like I'm stupid. And when I show them my artwork, I feel like it's, it's worthless and it's no good. I just, I go around just my whole life feeling like I'm not good. And I said, well, there's a way that you can feel different about yourself. And I said, let me explain Jesus to you. And she goes, oh, I, I've heard of Jesus. And, I, and we talked for a little while. And I was shocked. This is in America, like supposedly a Christian nation. And I began to describe Jesus to her. I said, you know, Jesus was with the Father in heaven from eternity. He goes, she said, he was? I said, yeah. He, she said, I didn't know that. 
And he said, then he came to earth. And he goes, yeah. She said, I heard that. And I said, and then he lived a perfect life. He goes, perfect? Nobody's lived a perfect life. And I was just, it was, it was blowing me away. She didn't know anything about the gospel. Now, I understand that's probably fairly common here in Scotland, but in America, it's unusual. And I began to describe the gospel. Now, the bus stops, and we get off, and she says, can you, and we're at the airport now. She said, can you talk to me a little bit more? So we go in, the doors open up into the uh, terminal there, and we're standing right inside the terminal. And I'm just describing more of just the simple gospel. Then Jesus was crucified on a cross. She goes, that, is that like those things on the cross? I said, yeah, that's, he goes, she said, that really happened? I said, yeah, he died. And I said, he died for you. And then it, was, then it really got beautiful. She said, he died for me? I said, yeah, he died for you because he loves you so much. And tears started streaming down her face. She goes, that's so beautiful. I've never heard that before. And then I said, he rose again on the third day. And she goes like, no. <laughs> it was like I was talking to like a total heathen. It was brilliant. It was like, I love this. I wish I could do this every day. She goes, no. He, he rose again. I said, yes, and he's alive right now. Where is he? He's like, you know, is he in New York or Chicago or probably Aberdeen? And she didn't say that. And, and so I said, yeah, he's alive, and he's, he's, he's in my heart, and he can be in your heart. Go, oh, that would be wonderful. And I said, he can fill you with love and life and confidence and victory. And all of a sudden, there was just this, and she said it. She goes, there is a weird vibe in this place. She goes, there, I feel really weird, like, but in a good way. And I said, that's the anointing of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is here right now to touch your life. And she said, I want what you're talking about. And I explained to her how to receive Jesus Christ. And I grabbed her hands right there in the airport and we prayed. She prayed after me, Jesus, Jesus, come into my heart, come into my heart, forgive my sin, forgive. And she's just bawling and weeping and crying. And then she opened her eyes, she goes, oh, I feel for the first time in my life hope and joy and life and victory. It's like she was free. She gave me one of her free art books. She had put this book together of, of, her, of her paintings and her photography, and she wrote her email address on there, and I got the chance to correspond to her and her to me, and uh, her husband's an atheist, but she's trying to bring him to church now. It's just like that's, that's what Jesus wants of us the anointing to flow in and through us. So I'm very concerned that we understand that we're righteous. So that, we, because, and why do these two messages, why am I talking about two seemingly very different things? Because I have found when I'm feeling unrighteous and unholy and unworthy, I actually don't feel like telling anybody about the gospel. You know why? Because that kind of gospel is not a very good gospel. Does that make sense to you? If, if I'm feeling like defeated and discouraged, and I have to earn God's love and favor, and I'm, it's a, a works mentality, I don't like to share the gospel. It's like, hey, I have some good news for you. If you work really hard, God might one day like you a little bit. That's not the gospel, is it? No, Jesus is crazy about you. That's the gospel. Jesus is thrilled with you. Jesus died for you. He rose again. And so we live a holy, righteous life so that we could be filled with the joy of the Lord so that we want to share that joy. The anointing comes out of us. It flows out of us like rivers of living waters. And, 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 it's, and it's not even good math. In John where Jesus said, uh, if anyone's thirsty, let him come to me. When did he say that? The Bible tells us in John, says that at the last day of the feast, the last day of the festival, that was a seven-day feast and festival where they got together and they drank and they partied and they ate and they just, they, they went from one event to the other. And now if I were Jesus, I would have said on the first day of the feast, I would stand up and say, hey, if you're thirsty, come to me. There's a lot of competition here, so come to my party, come to my booth. But Jesus waited till the last day. Why do you wait till the last day? Because he understood that after seven days of them going to all the religious events, all the religious sacrifices, all the blood sacrifices, all the rabbinical talks, all of the things on, uh, that were taking place in the temple, he understood that they would still be thirsty. So he said, religion's not going to fill you. Your own righteousness, the legal system of Judaism is not going to fill you. It's not going to quench your thirst. So if you're still thirsty after experience, what you've experienced these last seven days, then now it's time to come to me. And all those people are going like, yeah, religion is dead. Religion is not life. I want to be holy and anointed like you are, Jesus. You heal the sick. I want to heal the sick. You live holy. I want to live holy. You live before your father with joy. I want to live before my father. And he says, whoever, I love the math on this thing. The math doesn't equate. Jesus says, if you drink of me, it doesn't say a drink will come out of you, does it? 
That would be equal. One drink equals a drink. But he says, drink and rivers come out of you. I love that multiplication, don't you? Jesus says, just I want to multiply myself in you. My righteousness, my holiness, my love, my power, my anointing. I want to, you just take a couple drinks of me every day, a little bit, just get some of me in you. And all of a sudden, rivers of living water will come out of you. And he says, whoever believes will have this. And, and the reason many of us don't have it is we don't believe. We can't hold our hand up when we say, are you righteous? We can't hold our hand up. If, and I didn't even ask you, but I've said, if you're anointed, I bet half of you would not raise your hand. Because you're no, I'm not anointed. Only, only pastors are here. The, you know, the front row, there's the anointed one. And you guys are very anointed, by the way. So <laughs> but so are you in the back row. Yeah, so are you guys in the back row. So are you. The two or three in the balcony there. You guys are anointed. That, that, that anyone who knows Christ has received that anointing. But it's released by that one word Jesus said, whoever believes, rivers shall flow out of them. So you can drink of Christ and have him in you, but the belief has to be there for it to come out of you. You have to believe. And therefore, that belief only comes through risk. If you remember, and I'll close with this. Worship team, if you guys would come back. Um, you, you have to take a risk to be anointed. You can't be anointed and say, like, I've got anointed this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. Uh, but it's, but it's, you can't hide it. You can't hide it. And some of us are trying to hide the anointing because of fear. We have more fear of man. We have social concerns that we're not going to behave ourselves in a way that's acceptable. I've heard it said that dignity is not a fruit of the Spirit. Have you ever heard that before? Dignity is not a fruit of the Spirit. In other words, sometimes to be anointed, you have to do things that are out of the ordinary. Stop in an airport and talk to somebody. Stop on a bus stop and, and, and tell somebody about the love of Jesus. Do what some of the street uh, pastors do here and, and, and go out at night. Uh, just tell your friends, tell your neighbors that Jesus loves them. You're holy and you're anointed, just like Jesus was, and drink. And so Jesus' disciples came to him and said, increase our faith, or maybe you could say, increase our anointing. We want more anointing. And it's interesting what Jesus said to them. He, he didn't say... Um, yeah, I'd love to increase your, your faith. Nor did he say, no, I'm not going to increase your faith. You know what he said to them? If you had faith, just like a little mustard seed, you would say to this tree, or another point he says, you would say to this mountain, be cast out and move to the sea. And that was such a profound moment in my life when I realized the key to releasing the anointing that comes from being righteous in Christ, the, the key to that is if you had that little bit of faith, you would start saying, and I realized I would just, I wasn't saying to the mountain. You know what I'm saying? I wasn't saying to, to, the, to the girl at the airport, Jesus died on the cross for you. Or I wasn't saying to the woman at the restaurant how much Jesus loves you. Or I, I didn't meet my neighbor at the park with our grandkids and, and tell them, I was like, you know, I'm so proud of my kids because even at five years old, they're already praying and loving Jesus. And I, if I really had faith, I would start saying, I would start saying to that sick person on crutches in the park, hey, can I pray for you because Jesus can heal you. And I found now that I'm starting to step out in faith. I'm not asking Jesus to increase my faith. I'm saying I probably should start using the faith I have. Start using that faith, and then it'll start expanding and growing and become a river. But stay, drink and let some of the water flow out of you. But if it's stuck up inside you, then it's not going to have life. It's not going to be abundant life flowing through you. So it takes some risk. It takes some fear, uh, overcoming fear. It takes putting aside your dignity. It takes putting aside what people are going to think of you. Uh, what if I say something wrong? It takes getting rid of all that and saying, I, I would say to that mountain, be moved. So stand with me if you would, and I'm going to say to the mountain today in your life to be moved. The mountain of fear, be moved. The mountain of... of uh, of condemnation, be moved. The mountain of feeling like I'm not righteous, be moved. How many of you would like some of those things to be moved in your life today? All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak over you, and we're going to believe it be done now in Jesus' name. Father, for these with their hands raised right now, there's a tree or a mountain in their life to be moved. So, uh, Lord, I believe you're speaking to me right now that for some it's just an overwhelming sense of unrighteousness, even though you saved them and washed them and healed them and delivered them, but they're still in despair. Right now, in the name of Jesus, set them free. Set them free, Jesus, right now, so there's no more condemnation. You said there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We just simply have to believe that now. We're free. Now, I speak to the mountain, God, of, of unbelief when it comes to an anointing. There are some here with the, uh, I was praying for you, church, before that, and there's some of you have, uh, there's several people here that have a, an amazing gift in the arts, painting, drawing, photography, music, uh, sound recording, 
um, video, to- videography, and, and writing. And I was just praying over you today in the afternoon. I felt like there's, a, there's, there's at least three or four people here that the Holy Spirit has given such powerful gifts in that arena, and yet you're afraid to use it. You're, you're, you're afraid of what people will think of you. And I say to that mountain now, be moved. In the name of Jesus, release those arts, release those gifts, release the flow of the anointing when it comes to, to writing and singing and uh, producing and poetry. Lord, release it now in the name of Jesus. That mountain of fear and unbelief moves. And now in closing, I pray over this whole church, this whole church. God, this city needs a bold and on fire church, and this is it. This is one. Maybe there's some others here, but this is a church that's going to say, we're going all in for God. We're not going to hold anything back. We're going to believe you for miracles. We're going to believe you for signs and wonders. We're going to believe you for the supernatural. We're going to believe you for divine intervention. We're going to believe you for opportunities. We're going to believe you for the lost. Lord, lost by the multitudes are going to come into the family of God. Not just tens, not just hundreds, but thousands of people in Aberdeen are going to come to know Jesus Christ because of the bold witness in this church. Lord, it's going to be in the bus stops. It's going to be in the pubs and the restaurants, on the streets, in the, in the gymnasiums, in, in the basketball courts, on the soccer fields. Lord, everywhere we go, on our jobs, where we work, there's going to be an anointing on us, Jesus. And that anointing is going to break the yoke. It's going to break bondages. It's going to break free, Lord. All those things that the Satan has footholds, those mountains will be moved now. And we would say to them, be moved. Unbelief, blindness, deafness, be moved now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Let's put your hands together and thank Jesus for his power, for his wonder-working.